Oh. <laughs> so we're recording now. Um, hi, Tina. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Welcome to Outright TV. Hello, Dinah. Nice to see you too. This I'm really glad you invited me to join you for this call. <laughs> I'm glad that you accepted my invitation to join this call. Um, we started doing this. We started this initiative a couple of weeks ago called Outright TV because we thought, you know, in this time of um, social isolation and distancing, we wanted a way to keep in touch with uh, with our LGBTIQ community globally in some way. Um, yeah, and to find out how people are coping and what's going on and, and what are your favorite ways of staying sane during this weird new normal. Um, yeah, so that's the backstory. Um, why don't we start with, I mean, I know who you are. I think you're great. Haven't seen you in a few years though. I think the last time we saw each other was in Warsaw. Was it in Warsaw? I think was so. It, Brussels? it was one of the Yoga Europe conferences anyway. And which was in Warsaw. It was Warsaw, right, when we did the workshop on Prides. Um, so that was a few years ago. Why don't you, um, why don't you start by giving an introduction to yourself um, in a couple of sentences? Okay, so I'm Tina Kolos Orban. I'm a trans activist born and raised and still based in Hungary. So I'm from Eastern Europe and uh, I'm working with the Trans Manila Transgender Association, which is a national trans rights organization working in Hungary. And H Hungary is, I, I love Budapest. It's like, not, I think one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. But in the last few years, it's been a source of, of growing negative news. Um, and especially in the last couple of weeks, we heard that Prime Minister Orban was proposing to ban uh, access to, to legal gender recognition. What's, what's going on? Why is he doing this right now? Wh what is the situation? So the situation is Hungary is getting harder and harder. Uh, those of the viewers who have followed what is happening in Hungary, it's not a big surprise that things are going worse. But for those who, who were not following, I have to start from like 2010 when Orban got into power again. He was prime minister before and was not re-elected. So he was re-elected in 2010 and then started the trip which we are all going on as a country nowadays. And with the COVID situation happening, it seems that Things are really moving faster and, and forward or backward, whatever you name it. Like um, he just got authorization from parliament to rule by decree indefinitely because of the emergency situation. So there is no deadline to that and the parliament has voted that for him, which is not a surprise because his uh, party has two thirds in parliament. So they can basically vote on anything themselves without talking to anyone but still he needed this kind of power. And uh, then on 31st of March, um, they just introduced a bill proposal, an omnibus bill in parliament. And part of that is to ban legal gender recognition basically in the country. And we were first completely shocked. So I don't know the answer to your question, why now? Mm -hmm. And I don't even know the answer to why, He's doing this because I've been personally advocating on legal gender recognition at least for six years professionally. Like that was part of my job to do so. And uh, we've been expecting many things from the government, but not such a clear attack in parliament against trans rights. I don't know the answer yet. Okay. So it's been a steady decline in, in democracy and human rights over the period of his leadership, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, taking away power from others, putting uh, kind of guys mostly to places where he needs an ally, so to say. Like all different authorities and, and um, mechanisms in the country are ruled by people who are following his orders basically so we are going towards a country where the prime minister kind of has control of everything mm -hmm. and where every different body is following him so the covid-19 pandemic has basically given him an excuse or a, or a way to to strengthen that 
power more so than he had already done before it. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like that. And also the kind of extension of his power is meaningless to a certain extent. extent. So we are all just trying to guess why he is doing that now. I mean, the only answer I can come up with, because he can do it. So why not doing it? <laughs> uh, that's, I'm sorry that I'm laughing. It's just, it's like, it seems like there's a number of leaders around the world that have taken this opportunity to just amplify their power because, you know, they can. So why not? It's, it's crazy. Um, but I mean, as civil society and especially a civil society that works with the human rights of LGBTIQ people, we see this all the time, right? We see, we see leaders abusing their power. We see, and we see LGBTIQ people somehow being the scapegoats. And you said you don't know why he's, why he's proposed this bill uh, banning legal gender recognition now, but you know, it, it seems like it's a, one of the, um, I don't know, symptoms of, of this sort of rule. Um, but we're also, you know, as civil society, we work with this all the time and, and, and we're creative and resilient in our own ways. So how, what is, what is Transvanilla doing now? How are you, how are you coping in the situation? How are you trying to respond to it? So I, th I think it's important to know that Transvanilla as an organization was established in 2011. So Orban was already in power and we already have observed how he is kind of exercising his power. And we, we immediately realized that all the tactics that have been used in the past and all the strategies that have been used in the past will not work for us. So we developed our own strategy. We, have we, we tried to adopt to the situation that we function in and we keep ourselves to our strategy. However painful that is sometimes, because we know that if we go public with trans issues, which are not discussed in the public discourse, then they can turn that against us. And this is actually what is happening, that they go public with our issues and we are powerless and defenseless in that situation. And what we do, we still try to adopt we don't fight back, we cannot really fight with the government, obviously, so we use the tactics that we can do. We build resilience in our communities, we try to stick together and help out each other. I think it's really important to, to, to be there for each other. And, and we use international human rights mechanisms, because that's the only tool that seems to be useful sometimes, not always, but it's very difficult to operate in an environment where media is powerless, where there are no opposition politicians who, who, who have any power. So it's most, most of the tools that are used are just not functioning in our context. And it's a bit also devastating sometimes because we just don't know what to do. So basically what I said at first, we just stick together and we try to come up with, with solutions that might work. So but actually they might not work. Right. So it sounds like in a way you're working uh, to support individuals in the way that you can, as opposed to trying to do things like policy changes or legal changes, which are not a possibility at the moment. Yes, because it's impossible to find allies uh, in the country. We had one great ally, which was the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights, but uh, his mandate was over, so we lost him too. And now we have someone there who belongs to Fidesz and is not really willing helping to us even though his office has uh, published extensive reports on legal gender recognition, now the office is silent because the commissioner has changed. So all the doors are, are closing up and we cannot really move society. They will not move because of trans people. It sounds so surreal considering that Hungary is in the EU, right? It's part of the Council of Europe. It's you know, people talk about Europe as this beacon of, of LGBTIQ freedom, but of course they forget that, that Europe is large and, and that there are very big differences between North and South and East and Central and, and West. And uh, there's a number of, of, of places across Europe, like Hungary, like Poland, um, uh, where there's a concerted attack on the human rights of LGBTIQ people. And in the case of Hungary on democracy more broadly, it's, it's horrendous. Um, what... Um, you were saying before we started recording the interview that it, it's not often that, that you feel good these days. What does make you feel good these days? Is there something that inspires you? 
there are many things that make me feel good and that usually does not involve activism nowadays as I'm fighting burnout for years now. Even sometimes just cooking or doing housework makes me feel good. I, I do puzzles and I have color drawings to enjoy myself. And I have moved to a farm in November, which is really the thing to make me feel good. I can go outside, I can work in the garden, and I think that's what makes me feel good. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, you because of the farm now. proposal. <laughs> Sorry. So you live on a farm now. Yes, I'm living on a farm. I had to escape from the city for many reasons. Yeah. But that really helps with my mental health, and I think if we find a solution for our problems, we have to live with them. So I did that really on the right time because it's much easier to deal with the whole coronavirus situation here compared to bigger cities. Yeah, it's a, I mean, activists often forget to look after themselves. I'm very glad to hear that you are looking after yourselves. Um, tell us a bit about the farm. What, what have you got on the farm? So it, it's something we had to start from scratch. Now we have exotic animals, for example, foxes, or we have porcupines squirrels and uh, now we have like regular kales and chickens and I try to set up a vegetable garden for myself and we also have bought uh, the farm next to ours which we want to make as a guest house and we are thinking about providing uh, support to activists they could come here and hear from burnout so we have huge plans both with the farms and with the exotic animals and with the kind of usual regular farm animals that, that we have and, and um, we don't know where we go, we just explore this whole opportunity. It sounds like a queer sanctuary, both for you and, and possibly for other activists in the future. It sounds wonderful. Hopefully it's going to be like that. I, I, I'm really pleased to, you, to hear that you have this outlet, especially now, especially in light of the growing authoritarianism of the Prime Minister of your country especially in light of the, the horrible developments with, um, with legal gender recognition. It's, it is important to look after yourself and I'm glad you're doing that surrounded by foxes and porcupines and chickens <laughs> and fresh air. That's just wonderful. Um, Tina, thank you so much for taking time to talk to, to me for Outright TV. Um, it really means a lot to me that in this busy time you're taking you know, 15 minutes out of your day to, to, to tell us what's going on. Um, yeah, thank you. Is there anything else you want to share before we shut down the recording and I let you go back to your chickens? Oh, thank you. I just want to thank you and Outright for doing these videos. I think it's amazing and thank you for asking me to do this. It was a pleasure from my side. Thank you, thank Diana. You. Thank you so much, Tina. Um,